Hello again, and welcome to day nine of lecture. We're going to move from smooth muscle now to the digestive system. And this is going to be a nice, smooth transition for us because smooth muscle, as we learned, lines the GI tract. So we're putting this all together now. And we'll start today with the digestive system organization, and then we'll talk about some basic regulation of that system. And we're on to worksheet 9.1, very short, simple worksheet to follow along with today. And a few memes. Uh, student submission here down in the bottom left it says me signing up for hard classes versus me actually taking hard classes. I don't know, they can't all be winners. And then to some Zoom related ones that I thought were pretty funny. So it says, uh, me, the show is boring. And professor, again, this is a Zoom conference. Hopefully you don't feel that way. And then if you know your meme formats, this one will be funny. It says, I finally found a good Zoom background for work meetings. We'll begin today by describing the four primary functions of the digestive system. The main goal of the digestive system is to take the food that we ingest and pull the nutrients, water, and electrolytes that our body needs from that ingested material. And we accomplish this by completing the four functions listed here. The first is motility. This is where we're going to mix and move those ingested materials. And as we do this, the body adds secretions. Those secretions act to digest those materials and make them into smaller, more usable components that we then absorb. Now a little bit more about the GI functions. And we'll try to touch on these four things as we work through the layers of the GI tract today as well. So first up, we said we have motility. So motility, these are contractions that mix and move the contents of the digestive tract. So contractions that mix and move the GI tract contents. So whatever we ingest, we gotta mix it as it moves through and we gotta move it on down the line through that tube. So we have two forces. The first are propulsive forces. And those are gonna propel the contents, move them forward. And then of course we have the forces that help mix and churn that content. Next up, we have the secretions. Let's see, I'll do this in orange. Uh, collectively, we call these the digestive juices. So these are a mixture of water and enzymes that help break down our food, or whatever we ingest. And kind of a key point of this is that these are reabsorbed for the most part to prevent fluid loss. Next up, we got digestion. So this is where we have the breakdown of whatever the ingested materials are to smaller absorbable, that's key, units. So some of that we'll touch on are gonna be the carbohydrates, Let's call that carbs, they'll be broken down to monosaccharides, oh, that says monosaccharides, getting a little tight here. Proteins will be broken down into their building blocks, the amino acids, it's an AA, and then fats are going to be broken down into a few things, maybe glycerol, fatty acids, And then finally, make a little room for this in different color here, we're going to have absorption. 
Okay, and this primarily occurs within the small intestine. And that's where we transfer those absorbable units to the blood. Whenever we eat a meal or drink something, the body's going to try to get the nutrients that it needs from that food or fluid. However, most of the time, those nutrients aren't really available in their original form, and they're going to need to be broken down somehow. So, for example, we can look at some of these macromolecules that we ingest and see how they are broken down into smaller components as they move through the digestive tract. So, as an example, we can look at carbohydrate digestion. And we can see that they start, some of them, polysaccharides, start to be broken away, or broken down right within the mouth by amylase, right? And we'll break them down into their smaller components until we ultimately arrive from the small intestine to the monosaccharides. Proteins begin digestion within the stomach and we'll break them down into their small building block components, the amino acids. And fats, we'll break them down into things like fatty acids and monoglycerides. One of the two main components of the digestive system is the gastrointestinal tract, or the GI tract. We also call this the digestive tract. Uh, gastro meaning stomach and intestinal, well. And what the GI tract organs form is a continuous tube that goes from your mouth, the oral cavity, to your anus, and includes everything in between, so the esophagus, stomach, and the intestines. And that forms a hollow tube, right? We have the lumen, the hollow center. And essentially then, that is part of the external environment because it goes from the outside external environment, starting at your mouth, to outside um, the anus. And food is broken down all along that lumen and absorbed along the length. For a quick think, bear, share, I want you to think about how long that tube is. What is the length of the average GI tract? If you had to guess, just how long do you think the entire human digestive tract is from point A all the way to point B? Well, if you guessed that it's somewhere around 20 feet, you would be correct. It's all gonna start right about here. This is where your mouth would be. You're looking at the back of the tongue and then that's gonna transition into the esophagus or your food tube, which will then connect to the stomach, which is going to store that digestive material, bathe it in acid, and then slowly start releasing it into the small intestine. Now, they're called the small intestine not because of length, but because of diameter, at least when compared to the large intestine, but this is where most of your nutrients are gonna be absorbed into your bloodstream. And then we finally make it to the large intestine, also known as the colon. This is where you're gonna store feces, and then absorb water and salt, and then we finally make it to the outside world. That's one seriously long tube. We'll now differentiate between accessory digestive organs and GI tract organs. I previously mentioned that the gastrointestinal tract was one of the two parts of the digestive system. And the other are the accessory digestive organs that help out the GI tract with digestion. So the organs of the gastrointestinal tract are what form that tube from mouth to anus. And we said that that tube has a lumen, and that's where the food is broken down into smaller components that are going to be absorbed. And we said that that lumen is part of the external environment. So actually, if you think about the ingested materials, things we've eaten, they don't become part of the body until they're absorbed due to that fact. Now, the other component, the accessory digestive organs, they're the things that are not part of that tube, but they aid in the breakdown of food or they assist with the breakdown by the gastrointestinal tract. All right, before I give you additional information related to accessory digestive organs, I wanna take a minute and play this game. You're gonna identify each item as a gastrointestinal tract organ or an accessory digestive organ. So there is a spot for um, this on your worksheet if you wanna pull that out. Otherwise, you can just pause it here and on a scratch paper, either write a G next to the item or an A. So G for gastrointestinal, A for accessory digestive organ. Okay. All right, let's take a look. So we'll start with the mouth. That is a GI tract organ. That is your oral cavity. And we actually 
uh, begin digestion within the mouth. Salivary glands, accessory digestive organ. Teeth, accessory digestive organ. Pharynx, that is part of your GI tract, as is the esophagus. Pancreas, accessory digestive organ. Stomach, that's part of that tract. While the tongue helps manipulate food, that's part, that's an accessory digestive organ. Small intestine, obviously part of that tract, while the liver is an accessory digestive organ. And then the large intestine and the anus are GI tract organs. And we'll finish this with the gallbladder, which is an accessory digestive organ. Here we have an image to accompany the game we just played, where we can see the gastrointestinal tract organs on the right, and then the accessory digestive organs on the left. And you probably picked up on some few trends as we worked through these. So let's turn to the accessory digestive organs. Accessory digestive organs assist in the breakdown of food, and they assist in a couple different ways. So for example, some of them can produce secretions. Okay, so for example, the salivary glands, they're gonna secrete amylase. The pancreas can secrete insulin, or the liver can secrete bile, things that help aid the digestion of the contents within the GI tract. Um, the gallbladder, for example, that doesn't produce anything, but it concentrates and stores those liver secretions. It's gonna store the bile. So here's our gallbladder. Or they can simply participate in chewing and swallowing, the manipulation of the food, as with our teeth and our tongue. Okay, time to describe the four tunics of the GI tract and how those layers and sublayers relate to their function. And we'll go over some histology as well. For the majority of the GI tract, we see that there are four major tissue layers, or tunics. We spoke about tunics before when we talked about vessel anatomy. And we see these four major tissue layers beginning at the esophagus and then running through the large intestine. And from innermost to outermost, they are the mucosa. That's what is in contact with the lumen. Next, we have the submucosa, sub meaning below. The muscularis, made up of two layers of smooth muscle, the inner circular muscle and the outer longitudinal muscle, which is named by orientation, and then the outer serosal layer. The first layer of the GI tract, or the innermost layer in contact with the lumen, is the mucosa layer. Uh, this is an inner lining mucous membrane. So that just means that oftentimes we see mucus secreting cells here that help with protection against the digestive enzymes that move into that lumen. Now, this mucosa is made up of three sublayers. The first of those is an epithelial layer, and then we see a lamina propria and a muscle layer as well. So let's take a look at this epithelial layer. Okay. This is what's in contact with the contents of the lumen, whatever we've ingested. And often, most often, this is simple columnar epithelium, right? So we said earlier when we looked at this, that this is involved in secretion and absorption, which is the main goal of our GI tract, right? And then we also see in some areas that have high abrasion, like the esophagus, we'll see that instead they're lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Let's take a look at a couple of these. This provides a good opportunity for us to, again, look at some histology. You may remember that we've mentioned simple epithelium before when we were talking about the inner layer of the vessels. So that's that flat squamous cell epithelium. And remember that simple means a single layer of cells. We tend to find them in fragile, protected areas of the body, so internal, inside of vessels, inside of the GI tract, and they are good for absorption, filtration, and secretion. And that is the role of the GI tract. So we see here the type we're going to be talking about within the majority of the GI tract, like the intestines and the stomach, is this simple columnar epithelium. So remember we have the different shapes, simple means one layer, and that's followed by the shape of those cells. Squamous means flat, cuboidal, obviously cube-shaped. But here we're talking about these column-shaped cells. 
that arrange themselves in one layer and they're absor uh, involved in absorption and secretion. All right, let's look at a few slide preparations of some histology images. So here we can see, well, Orientus, we have the lumen here, all right? So this is the lumen of the small intestine in this example. And then we can see side by side all these cells, these columnar cells of this simple columnar epithelium. We can see that's a single layer there. The dark staining is the nucleus of those individual cells. And you can see they're jam-packed, just like shoulder to shoulder. And again, this is going to allow for secretion and absorption of material. So we're going to get the things we need out of the lumen and absorb them into our blood ultimately. With the small intestine, for example, we'll often see these goblet cells. All right, so we're indicating right here. Goblet cells produce mucus. And we got a little bit different orientation here. So the lumen is actually out here, so it'll dump that mucus here and add a protective covering for the contents that are moving through, help them move through with ease, right? So this would be our apical surface here, and out here is the lumen, while this would be the basement membrane back here. Now we also mentioned that areas that experience high abrasion within the GI tract are going to have stratified epithelium. Specifically, we're going to see this non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So we talked about squamous epithelium before within the vessels. Well, now we have multiple layers of those on top of each other. It's stratified, which means multiple layers of cell. And this helps add strength and stress resistance, which is important for those GI areas that experience a lot of friction. The areas of the GI tract that tend to experience friction would be the oral cavity, the esophagus, which is highlighted here, or perhaps the anus or vagina. We see them in openings to the body. Okay. And we can see here in the slide prep, we can see the flattened nuclei of these squamous cells. Okay. Now I should mention here we had keratinized and non-keratinized. Keratin just adds a little bit of a waterproofing layer to the cell. So in this case, it's non-keratinized. So we can see those flattened cells for a few layers up near the surface. Then they take this more cuboidal form as they approach that basement membrane. Moving on, we have the second layer of the mucosa, and that is the lamina propria. And this is composed of areolar tissue, which we examined previously, as well as some nerves, and then importantly, the small blood and lymph vessels. So this, in fact, is the site of absorption within these GI tract walls. In order to transfer the nutrients and water from the lumen, they need to cross the simple columnar epithelial layer of the mucosa. And then we enter the lamina propria that has those blood and lymphatic vessels. Highlight that there. Now, respectively, we see that segments with the highest absorption within the GI tract, they tend to have large surface areas. And that makes sense. The larger surface area allows for um, more absorption across that surface. So, for example, we have structures like villi and microvilli, we'll touch on shortly within the small intestine, that increase that surface area. Now, we also see we have high capillary density of both blood and lymphatic vessels within the lamina propria. And this also leads to higher rates of absorption. We see that the major sites of absorption are the small intestine and the large intestine. The small intestine is where we get nutrient absorption, water absorption, and electrolytes. Within the large intestine, this is mostly water and some electrolytes. Now as a note here, absorption is pretty maximal along the GI tract. Um, we get 95% of our ingested materials, or nutrients I should say on average, are absorbed. And whether this is good or bad, however we look at it, um, we are very efficient absorbers. So we can see things like carbs, the absorption is very high, around 98%, followed by fats, around 95% nutrient absorption. And finally, we have our third layer 
of the mucosa, which again is our first layer. <laughs> Lots of layers. And that is called the muscularis mucosae. And that's made up of a thin layer of smooth muscle. And when the smooth muscle contracts, it kind of shakes things up, and which does two different things. That's going to help the release of secretions from that mucosal layer into the lumen. And the second thing it does is it just kind of increases the contact of materials that's moving through the lumen with that epithelial layer of the mucosa. And that helps increase absorption efficiency. And finally, when looking at the mucosa layer as a whole, we see that there are structures that help increase surface area. So you can see these ridges within this section of the GI tract and these small little villi here. Uh, and these all increase surface area. So you can imagine these folds here. And then upon them we have the villi. And those both act to increase surface area where absorption could occur. And even upon these villi, you can have micro villi, little hair-like projections that further increase that surface area. All right, next we have our second layer, the submucosa. So this is a little difficult to see, uh, so I'm going to blow it up a bit. That is that pinkish purplish layer here in between this outer mucosa and the muscularis. So it's sandwiched right in between. Perhaps dark red wasn't the best to draw in there. But um, it is made up of primarily dense irregular connective tissue. And here we have dense irregular connective tissue. And this is aptly named because it consists of these clumps of collagen fibers all kind of clumped together. So this is often confused with smooth muscle. And you can see why. We can kind of see these kind of, I don't know, fusiform type shapes. Really, it kind of looks like a marbled steak, in my opinion. And we can see also throughout there, the fibroblasts that give rise to the collagen, we can see a couple of their nuclei, the darker staining areas. So I think they try to point that out here. Yeah, here's another one. So we got these big clumps of collagen fibers, and what that does is it helps withstand stress applied in all directions. And this is great for structural support for the GI tract. You can compare this to something like dense regular connective tissue which we know attaches bone to bone or muscle to bone with our tendons, which helps with uh, forces applied in one direction. Here's perhaps a better view of the submucosa layer. So it's this creamish layer here sandwiched in between these three layers of the mucosa and then our muscularis and serosal layers, our outer layers we haven't talked about yet. Characteristic to the submucosa, we can see that there are now larger vessels. We have veins and arteries that enter that layer. We also now have glands found within the submucosa. And then you'll notice these uh, gold nerves, so it's innervated, and that's part of the submucosal plexus. That's what that system of nerves within the submucosal layer is called. And that makes up part of the enteric nervous system. Remember we mentioned it before, it's kind of like a the GI tract has its own nervous system to kind of carry out some of those digestive functions uh, without other inputs. So we can see then that some of these uh, nerves, they go on to innervate the muscular layer of the mucosa, as well as some of these glands within the submucosal layer. All right, and on to our muscularis layer. This is the layers of smooth muscle that lay deep to the submucosa. We see it's actually comprised of two different layers of smooth muscle. The innermost is the inner circular layer. And then next to that, we have the outer longitudinal layer. Okay, so we got circular and longitudinal. And that's because our cells are oriented in different fashions. Um, let me attempt to illustrate this for us. So let's say we have our lumen of this section of GI tract. Okay. And I'll skip the other layers for now, just for simplicity, and we'll draw that inner circular layer, the first layer of our muscularis. And here we're going to see that those smooth muscle cells are oriented circumferentially. That just means they follow the 
circumference of this track. So they're going to be oriented in that fashion, those cells. Okay, now we're going to have our next layer, the outer longitudinal layer. And actually, it might help if I made this kind of a three-dimensional structure here. All right, so this is our section of that track then. And these uh, muscle cells are going to be oriented lengthways. So you can imagine them going in this direction. And what this allows for then is we can have contractions uh, moving in different directions. So if we get contraction of that inner circular layer, that's going to constrict the lumen of that section of tract. And if we get contraction of the cells that lay lengthwise, that's going to act to shorten this section of the GI tract. And this is going to lend itself well to both mixing and propulsion. So let's take a look at that. The primary function of the muscularis is to provide motility. And we started this lecture saying that motility, those are the muscular contractions that both mix and propel or move that digested material through the di uh, GI tract. This is accomplished by smooth muscle. Uh, and this accompanies what we talked about in the last lecture very well, because this smooth muscle is single unit. Recall that's when your cells become excited and contract as a single unit. Those cells are all electrically linked by gap junctions. And then it is also phasic. Uh, phasic smooth muscle exhibit rhythmic contractions, give rise to peristalsis. And we can compare that to, remember there was tonic smooth muscle, which is mostly partially contracted. The first type of motility we'll look at are the propulsive forces. And we call these peristalsis within the GI tract. This is directional movement of materials through the GI tract. Uh, we, and this occurs via sequential contraction of the muscularis smooth muscle layers. So the GI tract ultimately ends up moving like a wave to propel the bolus. So let's take a look at this here. If you have your mouth here on this end and then your anus here and then we have this bolus of food. The first thing that occurs is we get that contraction of that inner circular muscle layer, right? So that's going to contract behind that bolus which kind of pushes it forward. And then following that, we get a contraction of that longitudinal layer. So it pulls back this way, okay? And then we get a contraction again of that inner muscularis. And in that manner, we propel that bolus forward in a one-way direction toward the anus. Next type of motility we'll talk about are the mixing forces. And one of the types of mixing that occurs is called segmentation. So here we have a section of the GI tract, and we have some ingested material there, and we'll get contractions. This occurs primarily via the contraction of that inner circular muscle layer. So we'll get contraction that pinches that material. It's going to segment it, if you will. And then we'll again, we'll contract in a different spot along that tract, and it'll segment it again. And every time it does that, it's pushing it both forwards and backwards. So this type of mixing, it lacks directional movement. And what it does is it blends the ingested materials together and it mixes them with secretions as we do that. And the last thing we'll mention about the muscularis is the myenteric nerve plexus. We can see here that between the two layers, between the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal layer, we have the myenteric nerve plexus. That's shown with these gold nerve fibers here. Uh, and these are axon and ganglia between those two muscularis layers that are part of the enteric nervous system again, which we'll talk about shortly. And they act to help control contractions of the GI tract. The final and outermost layer is the serosa. And this consists of a thin layer of connective tissue and a single layer of epithelial cells. Those cells secrete serous fluid, hence serosa. And serous fluid is this watery, slippery fluid that acts to lubricate, prevent friction between the digestive organs. 
Also, the serosa is continuous with the mesentery, meaning it transitions to form the mesentery. And the mesentery is what suspends the digestive organs from the inner wall of the abdominal cavity. So they're not just all loose sloshing around in there. They are suspended from that abdominal wall. Now we'll talk about the enteric and the autonomic nervous systems and their role in GI regulation. Digestive processes are controlled by the nervous system, including both the enteric and autonomic divisions, as well as by hormonal control via the endocrine system. Last semester, when working through the divisions of the nervous system, I had mentioned the enteric nervous system. Right? We kind of had it faded out, and we said we'd get to it in the second semester. Well, now we're going to touch on it. The enteric nervous system, or you'll also see it the intrinsic nervous system, is one of the divisions of the autonomic nervous system, and it consists of this mesh-like system of neurons that governs the function of the GI tract. The enteric nervous system is embedded within the lining of the GI tract, and it begins in the esophagus and extends down to the anus. Now, the neurons of the enteric nervous system are collected into two types of ganglia, which we mentioned earlier, the myenteric and the submucosal plexuses. Remember, the myenteric plexuses are located between the inner and outer layers of the muscularis, while the submucosal plexuses were located within the submucosa layer. Now we can see here, if I grab a little pointer, we have both of these plexus. We can see they innervate smooth muscle and glands, the GI, and that's going to help control mixing and propulsion. Now, the ENS is capable of acting independently of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, uh, although it may be influenced by them. And for this reason, some consider it a separate nervous system because it can function independently. The GI tract wall is also innervated by both the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Those autonomic nerves influence digestive tract motility and secretion either by modifying ongoing activity within the enteric plexuses, altering hormone secretion, or acting directly on the smooth muscle and glands, which we'll revisit in a second. Now, in general, parasympathetic innervation is going to promote GI tract activity. So it's going to stimulate uh, GI motility, relax GI tract sphincters, right, rest and digest. And then in contrast, sympathetic innervation is going to oppose GI tract activity. It's going to inhibit uh, GI tract motility or contract GI tract sphincters. So basically conditions that activate sympathetic division like anger or stress, they're going to slow digestion. At the end of the last lecture on smooth muscle, we talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic influence on smooth muscle contractile cells. Now, smooth muscle, at least of the digestive tract, undergoes those spontaneous rhythmic cycles of depolarization and repolarization, and we said they're called slow wave potentials. And they're also called the digestive tract's basal electrical rhythm, or BER. So within the muscularis layer we just reviewed are the pacemaker cells. And the specific pacemaker cells here are called the interstitial cells of Cajal. Those are the pacemaker cells that generate these slow wave potentials that propagate to the other muscle cells via gap junctions. So if we return to our drawing here, we have this basal electrical rhythm, right? B, E, R. And I'm gonna redraw this just a little larger. So we have something like this, the basal electrical rhythm, okay? And whether we reach threshold is going to be dependent on neural and hormonal factors. So with parasympathetic stimulation, we're going to be more likely to hit threshold and get contractions then of that smooth muscle cell. Whereas with sympathetic, we're less likely to hit threshold and less likely to get contractions. And last thing we'll do today is look at the roles of the short and long nerve reflexes, and then we'll look at endocrine control of GI as well to finish. The GI tract wall contains three different types of sensory receptors, and these respond to the state of contents within the GI lumen. 
To start, we have barrel receptors, that prefix meaning pressure. So they're going to detect pressure changes, which are stretch changes in that GI tract wall. You can imagine ingested materials moving through, they're going to stretch that wall. Uh, we have chemoreceptors. They monitor chemical contents within the lumen. Maybe we're detecting lipids or carbohydrates. And then finally, we have osmoreceptors, and they measure how concentrated the contents are within the lumen. And stimulation of these receptors, that's what leads to secretion of hormones, or it can elicit neural reflexes, which is what we're going to talk about here, nerve reflexes. And these reflexes can be either the enteric nervous system or the autonomic nervous system, and they're going to help regulate and control GI motility and digestive juice secretion. The first type of reflex that activation of the above receptors may cause is the short reflex. This type of reflex includes only a local response where all the components of the reflex are contained within the GI tract wall. So this involves only the enteric nervous system and includes sensory and motor neurons within the intercommunicating submucosal plexus and myenteric plexus. Long reflexes, on the other hand, are going to have elements that lay outside of that GI tract wall, including sensory input to the central nervous system, as well as autonomic motor output. And the long reflex is going to help coordinate GI tract motility, secretions, as well as accessory digestive organ activity. Here's a visual representation of what we just walked through. So beginning with the short reflexes. Short reflexes are in response to local changes within the digestive tract. So those are where we take into account those chemoreceptors, osmoreceptors, or mechanoreceptors. So then via short reflexes involving the enteric nervous system, here they're calling it the intrinsic nervous system, intrinsic meaning belonging only to the GI tract, but it means the same thing as enteric, will bring about some type of change via effectors. Smooth muscles or glands, they're going to change our contractile activity or our secretory activity. Okay. Now we can also um, take external influences into account. Maybe we see or smell some delicious food and that's going to kick off some secretions or contractile activity to get things ready to accommodate food. Okay, so that's obviously going to involve the central nervous system. And then we're going to have input to the enteric nervous system from our autonomic nervous system. And here we can act to modify the activity of the enteric nervous system to bring about change. Additionally, we can have some of that information from the internal environment, some of that may go up to the CNS to inform the CNS, and then we can also have CNS input to modify the activity of the enteric nervous system as well. And we'll talk about hormonal control of digestion. And several hormones participate in regulation of digestion, and we'll elaborate these in future lectures when we talk about them in relation to the respective functions and different organs, but I wanted to introduce the hormones here briefly. So we'll start with gastrin. And gastrin is produced by the stomach and it stimulates secretion of gastric juices in response to certain nutrients. So we can look at the effects here of gastrin. And one is that we're going to increase the secretion of HCL and pepsinogen. And those work together to break down proteins. We're also going to increase gastric motility. So the mixing and propulsion of contents. Now it's regulated here, well, we will see that it's released in response to protein in the stomach. Right? The effects are that we break down protein, so if we have protein in the stomach, we are going to release this hormone, gastrin. Um, it's also going to be released in response to acetylcholine. That's that rest and digest neurotransmitter, so we want to kick off uh, digestive activity. It's going to be inhibited by low pH within the stomach. Right? HCL would continue to exacerbate the problem if we had low pH and we continued to add um, acid. Next we have cholecystokinin or CCK, which briefly it's present causes the release of digestive enzymes uh, and bile from the pancreas and gallbladder, and that's going to help break down fats and proteins. And therefore we can see that it is going to be stimulated by the presence of fat and protein in the upper part of the small intestine. 
And finally, we have secretin, and that's a hormone that's released into the bloodstream by the duodenum, the upper part of the small intestine, in response to acidity. So that hormone is going to stimulate sodium bicarbonate. Let's see, highlight that here. Released by the liver and the pancreas, and that's going to help neutralize those acids if they're present within the small intestine. So we see then they're, they're going to be stimulated by a low pH, or the presence of acid within the duodenum.